open now. I'm going to get some coffee just a sec. I'll be back. I do a cup. <laughs> you got a microwave your coffee? No. Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah, five to seven gigahertz. Hey, buddy, can you hear me? Oh, Bob. Bob. I can hear you. Congrats, buddy. Well, I've told you right away. I knew, I knew before you did, but I, I, I had to keep it kind of secret. Congratulations, man. So Thank you. overdue. Thank you, Thank you very so much. So long overdue. Oh, my God. Most passionate presentations I ever made in my life. I'm so happy for you, Bob. So happy. Hey. As I said, they get to the bottom of the burial barrels. No, 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 <laughs> no. It's just so long overdue. It's just we tried through section 14, tried this and that, and finally we came up with a proper strategy. And uh, with I, the big help I got was Ad Bax and uh, Tim. So you, we're having a, we have to get together and have a drink, Bob. More than one, right? Absolutely, more than one. A martini or two, and some wine and some good food out in Napa, like we did last. Well, I think the last time I saw you physically was in Napa, like years ago, in vitro, in vivo, I mean. Most of the other time we do now is in vitro, in vitro meetings. <laughs> we can do that now. I think Kendra has something to say, right? No, that's okay. That's... We have- we have a... these on You have there. to listen to me. Hi, Kendra. Hi, Kendra. Hi. I'm glad you got the stuff. You know the stuff, just so you understand, uh, whatever. I mean, no, so no. Just, just, just for everyone that's not in on the, on the joke, Bob was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And, oh, he uh, knows that. He knows yeah, that. Yeah, he knows that now. Yeah. Great. Finally. That's a secret that's hard to, to keep. I knew, I knew very early on, but I had to actually truly keep the secret inside. We had, to, we had a sealed thing. So, yeah, he's, he's had uh, been elected. Yeah, so I want to virtually mark the event, though. So we've um, just we're, we're doing that right now. And I guess, Alex, you've taken the cake, right? We all know this like worst kept secret. Bob is like at everywhere. He's at all the meetings, always with something new to share, center of the party, grilling students about DMP at the winter school, organizing the Zoominar. And so just because we can't get together right now, um, there's like a, I want everyone to be able to join and celebrate the achievement. So if you guys want to send a note, I'm going to put a link to a Google doc in the chat in a second. Um, if you want to share a slide or congratulations, there's going to be a link in the chat insult. for a, a drop loving insult, Kendra, a loving insult. A loving insult. That would be the best. Absolutely. <laughs> if you want to share a word with Bob at the end of the scientific session, um, raise your hand. That's okay. Come on. I've had. Oh, come on. <clears throat> and, um, finally, hold on. Hold on. Today is National Teacher Appreciation Day in the United States. Okay. And over the years, over 150 people have identified your lab as a place to come and train. And so before the scientific session today, um, there's, gonna, there's a brief uh, video with uh, congratulations from just a few of those trainees. And it's also May the 4th, you know? May the 4th be with you, yeah. May the 4th, we, yeah, right. What happens on May the 4th? It's Star Wars Day, Alex. May the 4th. Sorry about these things, I'm sorry. All right. Not Star, oh. not Star Trek, not Star Wars. 
Can, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. All right, this is for you, Bob. That's when Bob climbed uh, Kilimanjaro. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations, okay. Bob, on this recognition of your achievements. And hello to everyone at Friendly Bob's Neighborhood Magnet Lab. Congratulations, Bob. I can't wait to celebrate in person. Congratulations, Bob. It's about time. Congratulations, Bob, on an honor overdue but richly deserved. Good luck to you. Woohoo! Hi, Bob. Congratulations on getting elected to National Academy of Sciences. I also want to thank you for all the support you provided me while I was in your group and even afterwards. The experience I got in your group is invaluable to my career and you have been a true inspiration to me. So thank you for everything. I wish you all the best. Hi Bob, congratulations to become famous. I wish you all the best for the future. Hey Bob, congratulations to become an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and all the best and hope to see you soon again without Corona. Congratulations, Bob, for your election to National Academy of Science. It just became more official that your leading magnetic resonance technologies can change our world somewhere very soon. Congratulations, Griffin. That's wonderful news. Greetings from Baltimore, and congratulations on your acceptance to the National Academy of Sciences. That's fantastic. I'm very happy for you. Hey Bob, it's Nico. Very happy to hear that you got elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, congratulations. Hi Bob, congratulations on your well-deserved induction into the National Academy of Sciences. Congratulations Bob on being elected to the National Academy of Sciences. It's about time, eh? Hi, it's a great news, Bob. Congratulations. I really hope to see you soon and celebrate this over a glass of red wine as usual, which I will do that tonight myself for you. And Kampai. Hello, Bob. Um, congratulations for receiving National Academy's recognition for your long-standing contribution in uh, developing solid-state NMR spectroscopy and dynamic nuclear polarization into important methods for biophysics and chemistry, and in training many people in our field to make solid-state NMR research a vibrant and vigorous uh, intellectual endeavor. Congratulations, Bob, for this fabulous and well-deserved honor. I am super happy for you. Cheers. Congratulations, Bob. Congratulations, Bob. You've really earned this. Et voilà, avec toutes mes félicitations, Bob. Congratulations, Bob, on this very well deserved recognition for being an excellent mentor and a leader in our field. I hope you're doing well and to see you soon. Cheers. Hi, Bob. Congratulations. In honor of your recognition, I finished this bottle of Chianti on your behalf. Looking forward to doing more Chianti with you in the future. Bye. Bob, greetings from London and congratulations on being elected to the National Academy. It's great news and a very well-deserved honor. Best wishes to you and Judy. Hope to see you soon. Very good, all right. 
Thank you very much, Kendra, whoever, <clears throat> Kong, whoever um, engineered this. It was really quite nice. And I, I certainly want a copy of that. All right. Okay. It's our honor. Uh, well, it's, uh, <clears throat> I thank you very much. It's very flattering. All right. All right. May DMP be a few. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's okay. Well, well, we should, we should probably. Uh, it's uh, 10 after now, so we should probably get on with the, uh, the Zoominar for today. But again, thank you very, very much. It's really much appreciated. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So, Kong, you want to get the introduction, the ball rolling? Introduction started? Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, like, I'll just do it quickly because, like, people already have, you know, been here so many times. Um, I mean, I, thanks. I mean, this series has been going on for more than one year and I thank you for all the support and we will continue to do so. Uh, for those who have been here for the first time and actually we asked a lot of people to come in today, you know, because it's a, it's a special day. <laughs> May the frost be with you, your induction day. Uh, but nevertheless, like if you would like to know more um, or if you are interested in our series, feel free to sign up for our mailing list and then like and also like, all the past recordings like were uploaded to our website so uh yeah uh, we look forward to have more and more speakers so that we can like share science while during these pandemic times and uh yeah i will pass on to bob you can introduce our first speaker today i mean i yeah i mean uh before that i just want to like say like for those who just like join our session um um i mean there will be a quick uh discuss i mean kendra would you like to like tell the public about your uh, Google notes and also. Yeah, I just put the link for the Google note um, in the chat and I'll send the link for the Dropbox later to collect pictures. They'll stay open until tomorrow at noon uh, yeah. Eastern time. Would you like to explain what's going on? Because I, I think a bunch of people just joined in like just two minutes ago. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we're virtually celebrating Bob Griffin's election to the National Academy of Sciences. Everyone is welcome to join. You can leave a note um, in the Google Doc, which is open, and there's a link in the chat. Um, I'll also put a Dropbox link if you want to share uh, pictures or um, anything else. And at the end of the session, if you want to say something to Bob directly uh, after the question and answer for the second talk, um, raise your hand. Okay, <clears throat> so today we have two really great speakers for great topics. Uh, the first one uh, is Yufan Kwan, and he's from the Paul Schering Institute, Schurer Institute in Switzerland. Uh, <clears throat> and Yufan just finished his PhD with Patrick Hoptel and uh, Tom Benkenbach, two real luminaries in the field of, of dynamic nuclear polarization. And it was on the subject of photo excited triplets used for DNP. So that means basically pentacene and naphthalene. And <clears throat> that's what he's going to tell us about today. And then as soon as Yufan is done, uh, Jennifer Matthews will tell us about an interesting and intriguing new title, uh, <clears throat> TPPM DNP, a first report. And Jennifer's from Constance uh, right at the moment where she's an Emmy Nutra fellow. So Yufan, the uh, virtual floor is yours to be begin your talk. Just my slide, just a minute. Sir, can you hear me and uh, see the slide? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, congratulations to Bob uh, for the honor and uh, looking forward to meeting you very soon. <laughs> and thanks for the introduction. And also, thanks uh, Kong and Bob for, for giving me this opportunity to present some of uh, our work uh, that's been going on at uh, PSI uh, with triplet DMP. Okay, uh, I'll start with a brief introduction to the history of uh, triplet DMP, uh, which has been the motivation for us to start a business at PSI. And then I'll discuss some of the fundamental principles of how it works and uh, how we recently improved the performance. And the second in part, I'll discuss some uh, interesting applications where we use our highly polarized samples. So it's actually all started in the 1970s in Germany. Uh, it was shown that one can use this uh, highly polarized photo excited triplets to uh, run DMP to polarize the surrounding nuclei. 
and later in Leiden, Tom Winkelbach showed that one can achieve uh, extremely high enhancement factor uh, way above 660 using IC and uh, laser excitation. And later on, uh, there are several groups in Japan who made a lot of progress with AAA DMP. Um, and I want to show that uh, Takeda showed that uh, they can achieve 70% uh, proton polarization in, in a small part of uh, their material. And this actually has been the motivation for us to start a business at, uh, at PSI because this extremely high uh, polarization would allow many interesting applications. And there's a very nice plot uh, uh, showing the progress of uh, AAA DNP as a function of year. And uh, I'll later show that we have um, made further improvements of it. So how does AAA DNP exactly work? Uh, the typical uh, uh, polarizing agent uh, is, is mostly pentacene and its derivatives. Upon laser excitation, an electron pair in the pi bond of pentacene will be excited from the ground singular state to an excited singular state. Most of it directly decay back to the uh, ground level, but uh, part of it can go via inter-system crossing to a, a triplet level, uh, which is induced by the spin orbit coupling. And uh, due to the energy selection rule, only one of the triplet level is heavily populated, giving a large spin alignment or uh, polarization. And this can be used for DMP. Uh, one important thing is that this uh, population is uh, practically independent of uh, the temperature and field. Uh, so we can run uh, triple DMP at very moderate conditions. And how does the EPR spectrum look like? For example, when you have a single crystal, uh, here's a typical spectrum you would measure. You see two transitions. This is due to the so-called zero field splitting due to the electron spin spin interaction of the electron pair. Uh, so you have two transitions, uh, which is normally called the high field and the low field transitions. And I also want to show that uh, uh, by using deuterated uh, pentacene, uh, we can get a much narrower EPR line due to the less uh, hyperfine interaction, and uh, which has been proved that to be much more efficient in uh, polarizing proton or uh, nuclei. And of course, when you have a powder, you have all the orientations of the molecule with respect to the magnetic field. In this case, you see a very broad uh, uh, EPR line. But you can still use it to polarize. Uh, you can just use a, a part of the PR line to polarize. So how do you actually use it to, to do DMP? The sample we use is pentacene doped naphthalene single crystal. And a pentacene molecule simply kick out two naphthalene molecule. And it still forms a very nice uh, single crystal, which can be easily grown to large size. And then we further cut into small cubes uh, for experiments. And the typical concentration is in the order of uh, 10 to the minus 5. Uh, one thing I need to mention is the triplet has a relatively short lap time, uh, meaning that we need to transfer the high polarization efficiently to the surrounding nuclei. So we use pulse technique, and uh, we find that the most uh, efficient way for us is the field sweep uh, integrated solely effect. We run it with the X band system uh, with a repetition rate of kilohertz and uh, operated at uh, 25 kilohertz. And here shows the uh, typical build up with the red time of uh, 240 minutes. So we typically let it run overnight and second morning we have a highly polar sample and I will show later that we can achieve a, with careful optimization, we can achieve a, care, uh, a record of 80% polar, polarization. Yeah, quite large bulky material like five by five by five uh, millimeter cubic. And this is our setup. Uh, we have our uh, sample sitting in the you know, home built insert, which sit in a uh, home built helium flow cryostat that can go to five Kelvin. Uh, it locates in the center of uh, electromagnet, can be easily run up to 0.5 Tesla. Our uh, EPR and MR spectrometers, and uh, we have our laser set up in another room, and we couple the laser light uh, via fiber to the bottom of the cross dot. So this is about the introduction. Then I'll discuss something maybe more recent and maybe more interesting. Of course, we want to polarize our sample as fast as possible and uh, as high as possible. We can write down the polarization build up as a function of the triplet number density, the electron polarization, uh, the IC efficiency, the nuclear number density, and the repetition rate. Uh, this is a fixed value. The, this is uh, limited by the lifetime of the triplet. This we can optimize to close to theoretical maximum. And this only determined by the relative orientation of the molecule with respect to the magnetic field. So the, basically, the only left unknown is the triplet number density. Uh, 
there are, sorry, there are many parameters that we can optimize the, the triplet number density. For example, the wavelengths uh, and the power of the light. This is an easy one. We just want to put as much power as we have. How should we orient our sample and what temperature we should operate and what concentration uh, we should grow our crystal? Before we can answer these questions, uh, we need to first understand how light propagates in the material, which turns out to be not so trivial. Actually. This is due to the fact that uh, nothing is a bi excel single crystal and uh, pendensin is isotropically absorbed. Here. In order to solve the problem, we develop a model based on the construction of the complex dielectric tensor. We diagonalize it. And this gives us three principal axes and uh, the corresponding refractive indices. And the invariant part corresponds to the light absorption coefficient. Um, from this, we can write down the light absorption and the, of the propagation with any given wave vector k. Experimentally, we have a relatively simple setup. We basically measure light absorption, or rather the transmission, uh, as a function of the light polarization. And we we'll find fit very well to the data. Each measurement, we get all the information of all the wavelengths. And we also did the measurement to very low temperatures. So from this measurement, we can try the uh, light absorption coefficients as a function of uh, wavelengths and temperature. And with this knowledge, we can further study the triplet production. Um, here shows a schematic drawing of the energy diagram. Uh, from this, we can write down a set of rate equations uh, with some approximations. For example, the internal conversion is very fast. The left time is relatively long compared to all the other process. We can simplify it into three rate equations using the determined light absorption coefficients as an input. Uh, this can be numerically solved, and we use MATLAB to do that, and we can get the um, triplet number density after each laser pulse. With this, uh, we can further quantitatively study the polarization buildup. Actually, experimentally, we chose a highly concentrated sample to create a gradient. We polarized for only 30 minutes to avoid much of the influence of the uh, spin lattice relaxation. And then we measure the gradient uh, using a thin slice of a neutron beam. And we also drawn the, um, the simulation results. And I want to point out here that uh, this is not a fit. This is a direct calculation of this, um, of the, this simulation using all the parameters uh, we determined and we know. So it fits decently to the, to the data, not just in the uh, shape, but more importantly, in the absolute scale, it fits very nice to the, to the experiments. And with the model, we can actually further study the overall buildup of the whole crystal, which is typically measured uh, or monitored by an MR system. And we also want to compare the two laser systems we have, uh, one at 556 nanometer and the other at 515 nanometer. Laser. Uh, directly from the pulse shape, you immediately see that the 556 has much higher power, so it should polarize much better. This has been confirmed by experiments. So we polarize the same crystal, keeping all the parameters the same, but only change the laser in between. And uh, we also run the simulation, find the simulation pretty very well, the build up of, uh, with the two laser system. And we confirm that 536 nanometer is a factor of two to three better than the other. Another question we want to answer is what would the uh, ideal concentration we want to uh, grow our crystal? Of course, this depends on the application we want to uh, use. For example, if we want to build a neutron spin filter, uh, which I'll discuss a little bit later, uh, we need uh, extremely high polarization because the, the performance is exponential to the polarization. And we need a highly homogeneous and you know, large sample. In this case, we find the optimum concentration. And uh, here shows the buildup uh, of, the, of the polarization. But for a lot of MR studies, uh, you don't need such high uh, polarization because it's typically probably linear to the polarization, the performance, and uh, you don't need such giant bulk and you don't care about the homogeneity, then you can choose a much, uh, but you prefer a much faster buildup, then you can go for a much higher concentrated sample. Here just show a result of uh, a concentration uh, of a sample that we have ever grown. I'm sure you can grow even higher concentrated sample. And we showed that uh, we can achieve 40% proton polarization within 30 minutes in a one millimeter thick sample. Uh, just to shortly summarize this part, uh, we developed a model describing the triplet production, which helps us, uh, which is in very decent agreement with the experiments and help us to optimize the system. One factor that's not here considered in the model is the uh, triplet induced relaxation time. 
This is uh, only a minor effect. Uh, we did quite some measurements. We find this is uh, in the order of 40 hours, so it's not a big influence, but we are working on a model describing this effect and uh, hopefully we can implement this uh, soon also. So now we know how to polarize our sample uh, very efficiently to high polarization where do we want to apply it. As you might know that uh, PSI is a research uh, institute with uh, several large research facilities, for example, neutron source. So the original initiative for us was to uh, actually to build a neutron spin filter uh, for the neutron source using these uh, highly polarized protons. Just to remind you that the neutron is uh, very similar to protons, it's a spin one half particle with a magnetic moment. So this makes it, uh, well, it allows it uh, many applications using polarized neutrons. For example, you can also run spin echoes with uh, polarized neutrons, but that's not the topic of today. Anyway, a neutron spin filter, by its definition, is a device to polarize neutrons. There are several techniques that are well used in, in different neutron facilities. The Holy crystal to super mirror that I want to discuss, the polarized helium, helium 3, this you might be very familiar. Uh, you can very decently and efficiently polarize helium 3 to high polarization uh, using either muon or Xiong. And um, this can be used to polarize uh, neutrons due to the large spin dependent uh, uh, neutron absorption on helium 3. And similarly, we use polarized proton uh, sample. It utilizes the large spin dependent scattering cross section, meaning that one spin state of neutron is scattered away and the other prefer to transmit, and you're left with a polarized beam. The advantage of choosing polarized proton is uh, uh, the, this uh, spin dependent scattering cross section is large over broad bandwidth of neutron wavelengths. Uh, it's uh, probably one of the best techniques to polarize fast neutrons. And uh, it is extremely stable, requires only moderate conditions. As you might know, that helium 3 is very sensitive to magnetic field homogeneity, but it's not the case for protons. And these features allow many interesting. Uh, applications specifically for us, we want to build a neutron spin, sorry, a spin analyzer for magnetic small angle neutron scattering experiments. As I mentioned, neutron has magnetic moment, so it can interact with magnetic uh, material. Actually, polarized neutron scattering is a, is an extremely powerful tool to study the magnetic materials. As if you think about it, when you come with uh, the magnetic moment of your neutron. When it's parallel to the induced field uh, by the material, you don't have spin flip, but when there's an angle, you can have a torque and um, create a spin flip. By measuring these channels, uh, you can extract information of, your, uh, of the magnetic structure of your material. But since this is not uh, the main topic of today, I'll just uh, show you a typical example of what you can measure with uh, polarized neutron scattering experiments. And I will show you how we set up our neutron spin filter on the neutron instrument. Uh, as you might see, know and see uh, that the neutron instrument is typically very space limited. That's uh, the reason why we go for a triplet uh, DMP system instead of a classical DMP system, which requires uh, a cryo magnet and dilution fridge, which is very hard to, or basically impossible to set up on a neutron instrument. But still, uh, we need to bring the whole lab to the, to the system, which takes a lot of efforts and time, and you need time to polarize the sample. Uh, this is a quite based off with a very precious uh, neutron beam time. <coughs> uh, then we start to think that our system has an extremely long relaxation time, which I forgot to mention. By shutting off the laser, you block the main path of the spin lattice relaxation from the permanent centers. So you can have really long relaxation time. Uh, typically, we can achieve uh, eight 900 hours in, let's say, at 25 Kelvin half Tesla. So with this long relaxation time, we start think, can we do it in a way that polarized in lab and then we bring the polarized uh, spin filter to the instrument and we get rid of uh, all of this stuff. Before doing so, we did some careful uh, measurement of T1. We find that 80 Kelvin, 240 Gauss still have 20 hours. And so we build a sim simple device using some reverse magnets because we don't care about the field homogeneity. So after powering the sample, we mount this on top of our electromagnet. It tracks the sample together with cross start into this holding magnet, then carry them together to the uh, neutron instrument. Reverse the process loaded into another electromagnet there. 
the whole process takes less than 30 minutes. The temperature is typically kept below 60 Kelvin, so we shouldn't lose much polarization. And this has been confirmed by NMR measurements before and after. You barely see any difference. And then at the neutral instrument, you can do a precise um, proton polarization determination uh, using neutron transmission. And you can use thin slice of neutron beam to do a scan. And find we reach a record of 80% proton polarization quite homogeneously. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, large material like five by five by five millimeter cubic. In addition, we need to flip the proton polarization for measuring all the neutron spin channels, uh, which we do with uh, uh, AFP very efficiently. Sorry. Uh, the next uh, application I'm discussing that we are working on right now, which is quite interesting, I think, uh, actually based on the idea of this transportable spin filter. When one step further, we start seeing that with this long relaxation time, we can actually transport our sample to anywhere in the world. So we build a, a similar uh, device using the same design. Uh, so what we do is, uh, after polarizing our sample, with the help of overpressured helium gas, we can extract the sample out into this holding magnet. Uh, it's just in air. And uh, yeah, and then we carry them together on top of a Halbach magnet, keeping a field at uh, uh, 0.75 Tesla, load the sample in, and this can be stored in a, a cryogenic dry shipper, easily, keeping the temperature at uh, uh, 80 Kelvin. And this can be easily shipped uh, to anywhere in the world. And we did a real long distance transport uh, experiment. So after polarizing our sample overnight, second morning, we start from PSI, then we went to Geneva uh, using public uh, buses and trains, and then came back. Uh, the whole journey took longer than six hours. And uh, well, you see a nice view of the Lake Constance. Uh, our neighbor on the other side of the lake will give the second talk, just a small advertisement. I noticed this morning, the, the lake. Anyway, after coming back to PSI, um, uh, we load sample back into the cryostat, uh, measure the MR signal, you find the loss of the MR signal correspond to exactly about 50 hours, which is what we measured in a lab storage test. That's very nice. Another thing we did is uh, we, after polarizing our sample, we extract sample, crush it into micro powders, load it back into the cross start, and find we don't use much polarization. So we are actually working on an idea that we want to transport um, uh, the hyperpolar sample, crush and mix with another material of interest and let spin diffusion or cross polarization to transfer the polarization out to the target material. And this might be of interest to NMR studies. So the last part I'll discuss a rather exotic uh, phenomena, so-called uh, nuclear magnetic ordering. And you might be very familiar with the electronic ma magnetic ordering. For example, it, uh, typically when you cool down a magnetic material to low temperature, uh, below the current temperature or the new temperature, it undergoes a transition from permanent state to ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic state uh, due to the spin exchange interaction. This can actually also be applied to the nuclear spin system where there's a mutual Doppler interaction also. Uh, so in principle, if you cool down the temperature low enough below Doppler interaction, you should undergo transition to a older state. But you immediately see a problem. To fulfill this condition to cool down to some micro Kelvin, which is very hard to achieve. And this has been first demonstrated by Avergan and Goldman that you can solve the problem by uh, you by doing ADRF. Before going that on to mention that the Doppler interaction is a long range interaction, unlike the short range uh, uh, spin exchange interaction. So you actually have a lot more possibility of the spin uh, structure in the other state for nuclear uh, ordering. Uh, so how do you cool down the system? So first you do a hyperpolarization, uh, which cools down the spin temperature already. And then you run an ADRF, which removes the Zeeman interaction and further cools down your system. And the advantage of running ADRF is that you still have an external magnetic field, so you can use MR to study the uh, magnetic ordering or the spin structure of the ordered state. Before that, we develop a model to predict the ordered structure and the, what will be the transition temperature. Uh, also, the, the, the required initial polarization. 
uh, experiment is just polarized through high polarization. We do an ADR, as you see here, it's a nice uh, anti-symmetric signal. Uh, we did this uh, many times with different initial proton polarization. With high polarization, it's uh, low enough temperature, it should go to an uh, older state and the other not. As you see here, a uh, clear broadening of the signal, this can be understood as that uh, in the older state, the polarization is only determined by the local dipolar field, so I decide you should see a higher signal. However, this is not very concrete. Then we start seeing that we actually have natural abundance C13 in our system, which has magnetic moments and can be used as a probe to study the surrounding uh, proton ordering. Similar thing has been done by Abraham and Goldman to study the ordering of uh, calcium uh, fluoride and uh, lithium hydride. In order to see a C13 signal, we first need to hyperpolarize C13, which we do with such a sequence. We first demagnetize at the proton frequency and then demagnetize at the C13 frequency. This has been proved to be very efficient. With one pulse, we reach 50% uh, C13 polarization. And here shows two measurements of C13 with protons in the demagnetic state with high and low initial polarization. Uh, one is expected to go to the other state and the other not. And you see a clear difference with more peaks. This can be easily understand that uh, at the older state, you have a much better defined local dipolar field, uh, meaning you should have a more uh, distinctive uh, uh, peak structure. A similar experiment has been done with uh, uh, the same uh, initial high um, proton polarization, but demagnetized from negative uh, and positive spin temperature. The theory predicts only negative spin temperature can go to an other state, the other is not yet matched the criteria. And you see that uh, we see a splitting with this, uh, which is uh, uh, inconsistent with the model prediction. In order to further confirm the uh, ordered structure of the proton spins, we have scheduled a neutron experiment this summer. And the neutron is actually an excellent tool to study the new, uh, proton spin structure because the strong um, uh, neutron proton spin dependent uh, scattering. Uh, that's about all I want to discuss today. And just to short summarize, uh, we have the model describing the like, triplet production, which help us to optimize our system, reach uh, high performance. And we made our system, uh, the polar, sorry, the spin filter and the polar sample transportable, allowing many interesting experiments already. And I hope also the nuclear magnetic ordering uh, experiments uh, entertains you. And uh, I would like to give a lot of thanks to our group and also welcome to visit uh, PSI. It's a very nice view, uh, of course, after the, the pandemic. And uh, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, hopefully, I'm on time. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you want to do it or should I do it or? You go ahead, all right? OK. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Ivan, for showing us our very nice results. Showing us triplet state DMP, and then like especially like when you transport like so sample from PSI to to Lausanne in five hours, uh, or two and back. I mean, that, I think like that, that that's amazing that you do not lose so much and you retain so much magnetization after such a long trip, <laughs> and also like on the magnetic ordering. So um, I would go to the first question, um, on Q and A. So Dominic Kubici asked on slide seventeen, the proton polarization seems to have a steep cut off around four millimeter of depth. Is this a real effect and what causes it? Uh-huh. Well, this is a tricky one. Um, we, we also noticed that, uh, yes, it seems there's a drop in the, in the four millimeter position, which uh, we are not very sure what caused it. Uh, we could be something in the sample that we, we saw could be some uh, small defects in the sample that block some of the light or I don't know that I, we, are, we, are, we are not very clear about that. <laughs> okay, um, next question from Jeff Reimer. Like, can you com can you help? Would you comment please on how you measure proton polarization? I assume yeah. your microwave cavity has an RF coil for detecting proton NMR. Mm -hmm. uh, so the proton polarization. So I mean, we do two ways. First uh, is uh, it's as you. Uh, uh, as I mentioned that we can use uh, neutron transmission to do precise uh, uh, proton polarization because it scatters neutron. If you know the spin dependent uh, scattering cross section, 
you by measuring, let's say you come with the unpolarized beam and you measure the depolarization of the neutron after the spin filter, you can do a very precise uh, 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 proton polarization measurement. And maybe I have some slides for that. Um, sorry, this the scatter. Yeah. So yes, you have the cross sections. Uh, well, it's, it's a function of uh, polarization for the two uh, for the two spin channels. Uh, sorry, for the positive and negative, uh, or let's say parallel and anti-parallel. As as long as you know this, uh, you you can do a very precise uh, measurement of the uh, proton polarization. The other way, just typical uh, thermal measurement, uh, uh, and we find they are in good agreement. But you don't use NMR directly. You use I also use NMR. Uh -huh. So we compare both methods and find they are basically SAV. So the neutron gives much better resolution than the MR measurement they do. And why is that? Because of the um, the, because it's very hard for us to measure thermal signals. So we don't have very fancy MR system. We really. just have a coil on top, and it's very hard to measure thermal signals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, yeah. Uh, next question from Ilya Kuprov. The magnetic field of an NMR spectrometer in PSI would be tilted relative to the field in Geneva because of Earth curvature. <laughs> would you be able to transfer a sample between orthogonal locations on Earth? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure there's uh, no influence of it. We, we, we did a lot of uh, tests. I mean, we, we, we find it's extremely robust, this, uh, this uh, polarization. It's really hard to destroy. Um, I mean, we, we, as you showed that uh, we, we carried, we extracted, just uh, extracted it, it. There's a lot of uh, inhomogeneous field change uh, from the electromagnetic seat here and the magnetic field here. So, and we even tried uh, to, that, that we don't use this um, holding magnetic trace sample loaded into the the Halbach magnet just use the Earth field. It's not we don't lose much. Yeah. Ilya suggested that you should probably take a very slow train yeah, to make it adiabatic. I guess. <laughs> and our move is too slow to make it uh, adiabatic. <laughs> okay. Um. Next question from Jeffrey Bodenhausen. How do you measure the polarization before and after your trip to Geneva? Uh. Yes. I mean, we we measured so. So this measurement, we just do a, do a, do an MR measurement. We didn't uh, calibrate with the neutron, but uh, we, let's say we, we have a coil uh, that is calibrated to, to measure polarization. And uh, the signal, well, the loss of signal that's relative, but the absolute polarization that is uh, basically from thermal measurement. But the thermal measurement is calibrated uh, with the MR measurement, uh, sorry, with the proton measurement, uh, uh, sorry, with the neutron transmission measurement on the beam. So we do regular neutron transmission once or twice per year, and every time we kind of calibrate our M system also, and we always have a good agreement with them. Okay. Um, next question from Dominic again. The idea of transporting the hyperpolarized hyper spin filter is very nice. It also been applied to metabolites. I think like Sami Janan did that in the yeah. in, in, in Nature Communication 2017. He might have missed it. How do your Decay time constant compared to theirs, which are about twenty hours. I mean, it's shown here. Our uh, relaxation is uh, fifty hours at liquid nitrogen temperature. As I remember, they have uh, liquid helium temperature. Uh, so nitrogen is much easier to to carry, and I mean, we, we even use a dry shipper that uh, you can directly send via via post. <laughs> uh, we have our via uh, express service, but uh, if you want to go to helium temperature, then you need a helium doer, which is very hard, I guess. Okay, uh, next question from Timo Joels. During the progression step, how important is the alignment to the external bias magnetic field, or how much misalignment can you tolerate? Uh, um, <laughs> so, I mean, let's say, so we align it in a way that um, uh, with x parallel to the magnetic field. 
that has the advantage of uh, you use both sides of the dependency because they, they, let's say in the, in, the, in the crystal, there are two sides uh, with some orientation difference. Uh, they, they have the same long axis, but uh, they are kind of tilted uh, with respect to each other. Um, and uh, if you go to another orientation, you might see four peaks in the in the <laughs> in EGR spectrum. So you can still use one of them to, to run, but you just uh, waste half of the triplets. How much is the single crystal alignment matters if you misalign by five degrees, 10 degrees to you? Uh, five degrees don't make much difference. You still see two peaks. They, they, they are still, let's say the peak is still close enough to be together. Okay, so, so you don't- still within, within one peak. If you are, let's say 90 degrees, maybe you see more peaks. Okay. Two. You, you don't use a goniometer? Uh, uh, no, not very pre precise. Okay. You just put in and, uh, and uh, rotate magnet. We can rotate the magnet to align it. We can rotate the sample and the magnet to align it. We just find the, the largest EPR uh, signal. Okay. So um, if there's no more question, does anyone have any more questions? So I, <clears throat> I have a question here for you. So we see <clears throat> when we do the integrated solid effect with the frequency sweep, we see the we see the so-called stretch solid effect. Oh yes, <laughs> well, the integrated solid effect, and actually yes. stretch solid effect is gives you larger polarizations. Um, <clears throat> but you guys have never seen that. Now is it because you just don't sweep the field over that larger range? Um, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. I mean. I, I know this uh, this uh, the, the result of you. Uh, there's something I don't think we have ever seen, and we have never really tried to sweep uh, far outside of the spectrum yet. And um, so I, I don't have a good answer to that uh, yet. But, yeah. but maybe you can can you comment on your EPR line width because like yours is so broad. Yes, our EPR line is also relatively broad, so. Like how how big are they? Uh, five goals. Um, for, uh, for that's not so broad. That's fifteen megahertz. Yeah, you know? that's uh, not very narrow. <clears throat> yeah, mm -hmm. and and the deuterated species especially, it's okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Even sixteen gauss is not that bad. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, I mean, it would be an interesting thing to to maybe look for in some of these. Yeah. Sure. Okay, Ilya, Ilya still has a question. He says, I am oh. still unclear about rotation of the earth and Magnus with it and transport. How much of an effect would you expect? Uh, well, we expect no effects because we have a 0.75 Tesla magnet holding the sample inside. So I guess the earth field doesn't make much influence to the field inside. Suppose that you just do the experiment, but you don't transport it to Geneva. You just take it out, like live in the same lab and wait for 50 hours and you put it back. Would you yep. expect the same results? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we measured in a lab storage test. So we actually, we extracted it huh? in and loaded it back. Let's say we actually loaded extraction and uh, loading back uh, many times and uh, plotted maybe. Uh, and find, we measured this 50 hours and it may have uh, okay, actually. Okay, yes. maybe Ilya, yeah, you want to elaborate your question because I don't think we have interpreted your question correctly. Ilya, would you like to? Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine. Uh, so this has been answered. No, it's not, I, I don't mean the Earth's field, of course. I mean the orientation of the NMR machine. Uh, the NMR machine in London is perpendicular to the NMR machine um, somewhere in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, no, I think... Uh... From our experience, is always uh, adiabatic. You always can find a way that is, our, let's say, our movement is uh, really slow, and uh, the field always uh, goes adiabatically some way. It's, um, it's fascinating, yeah. isn't it? Um, such a long time scale. Well done. Um, All right, there's, a, <clears throat> there's one further question. Uh, <clears throat> from Zhao Xi, uh, how do you evaluate the effect of Halbach field orientation? I suppose that in your current setup, the orientation of the polarization is perpendicular with respect to the transport Halbach magnet? Uh, 
uh, sorry, sorry, I don't follow very well the question. So we, we let's see, if I understand correctly the question, uh, so we can know the alignment. So <laughs> below sample, we can rotate sample as well as the magnetic field in, let's say, in the horizontal plane. Then we can align it, find the largest, uh, um, let's say, EPR spectrum signal. Uh, this is always uh, the signal where the x-axis uh, is um, in the in the vertical plane that is uh, with, with the magnetic field. And by measuring the zero field splitting of the two signals, we can do a we, we know very well how the, the let's say how the crystal is aligned with the magnetic field. Actually, by by measuring uh, the frequency between the two two peaks. Uh, Alex, I think you have a question, right? You raise your hand just now. I had read my hand to, to make a comment about the beautiful connection between uh, DNP and polarized neutrons. But in the interest of time, I'll write separately to you find about it. I mean, Oberhauser did experiments on DNP, of course. At Berkeley, it was considered uh, by Charlie Kittel, his supervisor, to be an outrageous idea, violated the second law. But then Overhauser went on to do neutral interferometry at uh, Larry Langevin. And so just briefly in, in, in one minute, um, and this is something people, not many people know about Overhauser. He did the first experiments together with Bonzer on splitting a neutron beam in a silicon crystal into two. And then you can do a spinner type uh, rotation of the spin in the polarized neutron and show that you get a destructive interference after 360 degree rotation. So it's a spin one half fermion. But then he did a more spectacular experiment. He took the two beams that were split by the, new, by the neutron crystal, one above the other. So one closer to the earth than the other. And he measured the gravitational shift of the phase of the wave function of the neutron by doing inter interferometry. So the same overhouses, just to show that as smart as you think he was, he was, uh, what do they say, smarter, smarter by, by a half. It was an uh, extremely beautiful experience. And that ties, beautiful lecture, by the way, beautiful seminar. Uh, and this couples, same guy, Overhauser, to DNP and to polarized neutrons uh, and polarized neutron interferometry. So just that comment, and that's it. Beautiful talk, Yifan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, OK, Yifan, there's another question, <clears throat> uh, but uh, maybe you could answer that uh, online uh, in, in the Q&A, all right? Yeah. OK. OK. All right, so our, if you could stop, yeah. So our second speaker today is Jennifer Matthies. Uh, and Jennifer was a PhD student in Leiden, uh, <clears throat> uh, where she worked uh, on EPR, high field EPR with Jan Schmidt and uh, the group, the big group of very famous EPR spectroscopists there. Uh, she was a postdoc here at MIT for a while. And now she's an Emmy Nutra fellow at the University of Constance in Germany. And today she's going to tell us about TPPM DNP, which is a very intriguing new title. Okay, Jennifer. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bob and, and Gong for uh, the invitation. And also Bob, from my side, congratulations. Uh, I, I cannot say it to you in person. Um, this was long overdue. <laughs> um, okay, so I will start uh, sharing my screen. Um, um, I hope you can see all that. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, start the slideshow. And my laser pointer. Yeah, everything yeah. works. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just call me in my office if it crashes. But anyway. Um, all right, so uh, my presentation uh, today is actually a first report on uh, TPPM. Uh, DMP. So, um, well, the entire talk, as you can probably guess, is about uh, pulse DMP. So, um, uh, uh, actually, so um, I would like to start um, by just telling you what I mean when I say pulse DMP. So, uh, basically, this is um, that we apply the microwave radiation to an NMR sample that we have prepared, of course, first for uh, DMP in the form of a pulse sequence. And we do this with the aim to enhance the bulk nuclear polarization. 
And so why are we interested in this? So I've listed here three reasons. And um, the first reason is that with post DMP, uh, it might be possible to dodge the, this detrimental field dependence that's associated with classical uh, DMP mechanisms, which rely on continuous wave irradiation, such as the solid effect and the cross effect. And where this comes from is that really the effective Hamiltonian that describes the polarization transfer in these DMP pulse sequences does not have an explicit dependence on, on the field strength. So the second reason that uh, we're interested in this is that with pulse DMP, it might be possible to do DMP with a very low duty cycle. So we would be decreasing the average microwave power that we are applying to our sample because we only apply a pulse sequence every now and then. So this would significantly reduce sample heating. And, and to illustrate this point further, I included this figure where, I, uh, it's, where it shows the, the wavelength um, uh, against the absorption. So the microarray's absorption of ice. So for example, if you look at q band so 34 gigahertz, proton Larmor frequency of 51 megahertz, and you compare that to 800 megahertz, 527 gigahertz, you see that the, the absorption of the microarrays might increase by an order of magnitude. So this might become more relevant when you do DMP at higher uh, microarray frequencies at higher fields. And as point three, I put here uh, general coolness, and I put that here because it seems that my, um, magnetic resonance spectroscopists typically get very enthusiastic when you talk about uh, this topic. Um, and I think there's good reason uh, to be enthusiastic about this. Just when you look at the history of NMR, it's very clear that uh, the moment it became possible to do a coherent manipulation with radio wave pulses of nuclear spins, this opened up a whole new world of new experiments and new applications that people had not thought of before. Um, so I think there's good reason to um, have expectations of, of new things that could come out of pulse DMP. There is, however, a major challenge, challenge, and that is that microwave sources that could actually do these experiments are typically not available um, at microwave frequencies um, above uh, 10 or above 100 gigahertz. So this is the reason that for now, when we want to do pulse DMP experiments, we're still confined to a relatively low magnetic field. So, but let's not get discouraged. Uh, let's just start exploring. So when we prepare uh, our uh, DMP sample or we prepare our NMR sample for DMP, we dope it with a polarizing agent. And typically, or a good concentration of polarizing agent is about 10 millimolar. So that means that the number of electrons from which you're trying to get the polarization to the nuclei, typically protons, is way smaller than the number of protons that you have in your sample. So di this dictates the basic scheme that you use in pulse DMP. So there is here uh, a DMP sequence during which the polarization, tra polarization transfer is actually happening. So this can be the novel sequence or for example, uh, Kong's top DMP uh, sequence. And so this uh, sequence is then followed, the DMP sequence is followed typically by a, uh, a period of electron spin relaxation. And this, then, this, is, this block is then repeated thousands of times to build up bulk dynamic nuclear polarization. So after this period, you do a single NMR detection, for example, using an echo sequence. Um, and if you're still not happy with your signal to noise ratio, then you may want to repeat this whole thing. And then if you're studying DMP sequences or you want to compare them, then it's, it's a good practice to put in a pre-saturation sequence as well. So the important thing to note here is that during uh, the polarization transfer, we're not doing anything to the nuclei. We're not applying radio wave pulses, for example. And the other uh, important point is that um, we want the electron polarization uh, to land along Z. So we want, uh, or actually the IZ operator for the, the nuclear, uh, nuclear spins is the relevant operator when we talk about pulse DMP. So the archetypical um, DMP pulse sequence is novel, uh, which is short for a nuclear spin orientation via electron spin locking. And indeed you apply with your microwave, you apply a spin lock. To, uh, to your electron spins. Um, so if you do uh, during the, the, the log pulse or during the contact pulse, if you do this correctly, meaning that you, um, you apply your microwave power and the microwave amplitude such that the, the nutation frequency of your electrons is equal to the proton Larmor frequency, you will see a polarization transfer. So this works really well um, in uh, systems that are compatible with biomolecular um, DMP solid state NMR, such as Tritol and DMP juice. 
at X band. So that is 9.7 gigahertz proton normal frequency, 15 megahertz. Enhancements are easily two orders of magnitude. And this contact time is typically short, 300 nanoseconds, polarization is transferred, you're done. There is, however, a big problem with novel. And that is that this mutation frequency is uh, equal to the thermagnetic ratio of the electrons times the magnetic field component of your microwaves, the B1 field, which is proportional to the square root of the microwave power. So if you would want to do novel at a proton Larmor frequency that's two times higher, you need four times more power. And actually, this is already complicated at Q band, or at least we cannot do this at Q band at 34 gigahertz, 51 megahertz with our instrument. We can't, we can't get there. So if you talk to a microwave engineer, he or she might start sweating when you, you talk about 263 gigahertz and 400 megahertz. And this person probably doesn't even want to talk about doing this at 800 megahertz. Fortunately, we now have um, two sequences that address this problem. So they relax this high power microwave requirement. And actually the first one is off resonance novel. So here, the, the matching condition is a general matching condition. So we match the proton Larmor frequency, not just to the uh, nutation frequency of the electrons, but to the effective frequency. So what this means is that we now have the opportunity, let's say we work on a spectrometer where we do not quite have the microwave power to match the proton Larmor frequency with the nutation frequency. We can compensate for that by going off resonance. And this works really well, also at x band. So you see here, this blue curve is on resonance novel. At 15 megahertz, we see that the DMP is most efficient. And here, the, the squares going from blue to red, you see that when we go off, reson we go off resonance and we have a lower uh, nutation frequency, the enhancement is well maintained down to an amplitude of 7 megahertz or so. So this is one way of, of relaxing this microwave power requirement. So this generalized matching condition, you can derive it in a way that's actually pretty straightforward um, if you are a solid state NMR spectroscopist, because the method that you use is fairly similar to the method that you use when you do uh, when you derive the matching condition for cross polarization. So here, this is the, the Hamiltonian that you start with. Uh, and perhaps the most important term here is this term, sometimes called the pseudo secular term, which describes the electron proton dipolar coupling. So it has SZ and IX, and it is responsible for DMP in novel, but also in, in top DMP. So we apply a series of frame transformations. Uh, and he, so here we, have an, we end up in our interaction frame that's rotating with the effective frequency of the electrons, and here the nuclear Larmor frequency. And in, in CP, this would be the effective frequency of uh, your low gamma nuclei, for example, your carbon-13. Your interaction Hamiltonian then uh, looks like this, and you can just average to, uh, to get to the average Hamiltonian to, to see um, the, the polarization transfer. And you can see from, uh, from, from this expression that depending on how you choose your effective frequency and your uh, proton Larmor frequency, you will either um, or you will either have the double quantum or the zero quantum term survive in your average Hamiltonian. So for top DMP, um, it's actually somewhat more difficult to uh, de derive this matching condition. So we start with a very similar um, Hamiltonian, but now we have not uh, um, a log pulse, but we have this pulse string. So we still have the electron uh, proton dipolar coupling, but now this mutation frequency is time dependent. So when you want to go to the, inter to the appropriate interaction frame, it, it's all become, it becomes a lot more complicated and becomes difficult to analytically derive it because here you have this SZ and SX in this exponent and they don't commute and it, it all becomes pretty messy. Um, and also, in, in the end, in your final, uh, in, in your interaction, uh, Hamiltonian interaction frame, but you, the double quantum and zero quantum will not be so nicely separated anymore as they were in the description of novel and of resonance novel. So nevertheless, here, there's a general description that you can use for the Hamiltonian in this interaction frame, which is really just a Fourier series, where there are three basic frequencies. So the first one is the proton Larmor frequency. Um, and the second is a modulation frequency, which is just the time of the pulse sequence uh, of 2 pi divided by the time of, uh, of the pulse sequence, so Tm. And there's the third frequency, which is the effective frequency, which is defined as the effective flip ang uh, free, uh, angle divided by, the, by Tn, so the time of one block in the pulse string. So this, uh, the spins under influence of the 
pulse strain undergo a very complex trajectory. And here you see just an example of that. So this effective frequency will depend on the resonance offset, uh, the nutation frequency, the pulse length, and the delay that you are losing. So actually to, to describe all of this, you would need uh, Floquet theory. So I, I, this, it's not something that I want to talk about now, uh, but I think based on this, or if you see this Hamiltonian, it's intuitively, you can guess that there might be a matching condition, uh, which looks like this. So I have plus or minus the proton Larmor frequency, uh, then a multiple of the modulation frequency and plus or minus the effective frequency. And I want that to be zero. And yet in that case, I'm expecting a polarization transfer. So this is actually Kong's idea to, to, to do this. And he also implemented that at XBAND with good success. So here you see his experimental field profile, which you measure at four megahertz uh, nutation frequency. And again, you see that the enhancement numbers are uh, well into the oh, two orders of magnitude. Together with Ralph Verbe, he also implemented that at QBAND. Uh, so here you see the experimental uh, field profile from, from the paper. And here they use a uh, nutation frequency of 20 megahertz. Again, the enhancements are two orders of magnitude and their pulse length was here 10 nanoseconds and the delay of 40 nanoseconds that they used. So you see now that we are really get, moving towards a solution. We are now comfortable with doing pulse DMP at QBAND at 34 gigahertz, 51 megahertz. And now we can start to think about doing all of this at 400 megahertz or 263 gigahertz. So um, if you ask me, this is really just the beginning. So what I'd like to do now in the remaining part of my talk is about talk about two new uh, DMP sequences, um, namely uh, TPPM DMP and XIX DMP. And this is a, probably a good moment to mention that a large part of the work that I'll be talking about was done by my postdoc Rao, and here you see uh, his picture. So most of you probably know uh, TPPM and XIX as sequences that are used for heteronuclear decoupling. So TPPM stands for two pulse phase modulation, uh, XIX stands for X inverse X. So the TPPM sequence is really, it's also a pulse train, but now there are no delays, but actually the phase um, is actually uh, flipped between the two pulses. So pulse one has minus phi over two, pulse two has phase phi over two, minus phi over two, phi over two, and so on. So for XIX, or XIX is actually a special case of TPPM. If I set the phi to pi, 180 degrees, I end up with X minus X, X minus X. So hence the name X inverse X. Um, so what I will uh, show you today is that they can also be very well used to do DMP. And actually their matching conditions are similar to the matching conditions for top DMP. The only difference is that the effective frequency that we use now looks very different. So the expression for the effective frequency looks different, uh, which makes sense because under the influence of these sequences, the trajectories of the spins will obviously be very different. So actually we started this project and we started simulating pulse DMP with spinach. So spinach is the um, magnetic resonance simulation package or library maintained by Ilya Kupov uh, and his team. And it's, it, it's been really helpful for us in this project. So we are actually in simulating an ensemble of dipolar coupled electron proton spins. So we're just focusing on this very first step of polarization transfer. We're trying to keep it simple. We don't really want to worry right now about all the other things that are happening. So in the simulations that I will show you, uh, we had a 1.8 megahertz dipolar coupling, which corresponds to a distance of 3.5 angstrom. We do powder averaging, and we also have some small GN isotropy to mimic the EPR line width of Tritone. So it's actually really straightforward to do these simulations. The only thing that you do need to be aware of is that you need to add the label or the specification ESR to your code, because otherwise spinach will not take into account the pseudo secular terms in the Hamiltonian, and in which case you will see no DMP. So then you program your sequence and you simply observe IZ. If your sequence is DMP active, you will see that the IZ will change during the sequence. So the experiments that I uh, will show you were all done at QBand on our QBand uh, pulse DMP uh, spectrometer. Uh, the sample contained tritol in DMP juice 
And actually, we just realized from UV Vis last week that um, our concentration is 2.5 millimolar. Um, so this explains that some of our enhancement numbers are a bit lower than what you're maybe used to. But we also know that up to roughly 10 millimolar, the, the enhancement increases linearly with the concentration. So you can probably multiply the numbers that we get with, with a factor of three or so to get the enhancement that should be possible to be accomplished. So this is a photo of our spectrometer. Uh, it's a normal or standard Bruker pulsed EPR spectrometer. Um, actually, it's, it has a, it's an expense spectrometer with a Q-band extension. And we have extended it further with an NMR console so that we can do NMR excitation and also detection. And uh, the main part here was uh, that we needed to extend the Q-band EPR ender probe with a proton NMR uh, tuning box, which is uh, attached to it. And we build that in, in our shop here, in the electronic shop here. So um, you see this small little box here is actually our Q-band amplifier. So the pulses are made at low power and then they're amplified, but this is a bit of an old one and it can only produce 10 watts. And I should also mention that the rise fall time is 13 nanoseconds. So that's really fairly long, <laughs> um, but I will say a bit more about that later. Hopefully next month we will get a new amplifier. Brooker has now a much better version, which can actually produce 50 watts and has a rise time of 10 nanoseconds. But for now, we're stuck with this instrument and we just have to make do. Okay, so let's look at some data. And so actually we started with the XIX sequence before we started thinking about the general version, TPPM. And our, our reasoning was very simple. We just wanted to make an improved version of top TMP. And we thought it would be a good idea to make the sequence, sequence anti-symmetric. So then we ended up with X minus X. So our, um, our amplifier leads to a mutation frequency of 17.8 megahertz. It's fairly constant. On a good day, you might get 19 megahertz. And um, as I mentioned, the, the rise and fall time is 30 nanoseconds. So we thought it would be a good idea to start with long pulses. So here we choose a, chose a pulse length of 48 nanoseconds, which gives a modulation frequency of 10.4 megahertz. So clearly, in order to get to the proton Larmor frequency, we will need to use, need to use a multiple of this modulation frequency. So you see that nicely in this figure. So this is the modulation frequency, 10.4. The green curve is the effective frequency for the XIX sequence. Um, the blue line is the proton Larmor frequency. And in black and cyan, you see five times the modulation frequency uh, plus or minus the effective frequency. So here there are intersections with the uh, proton Larmor frequency. So that is where we could expect DMP. So this, this figure in the middle shows the contact curve um, at this resonance offset for these experimental conditions. The red line is the simulation with spinach. So you see here the time, the contact time, the time during which we apply the pulse. And here you see IZ. Um, so you see that the, the polarization transfer is pretty much done after 1.5 microseconds. This is the experiment accompanying experimental data. And you see that it matches or reproduces this simulation fairly well. This dashed line here, this vertical line, is at 672 nanoseconds contact time. And here you see a 2D optimization, a simulation uh, that Rao did um, for these experimental conditions. Red means positive enhancement, blue means uh, negative enhancement. And you start to see the pattern that we were expecting based on these calculations of our effective frequency. So if I now make the contact time longer, so I go further into the contact curve, you see that these features have become more intense. And you also see that we now get some stuff here in the center, which is perhaps not unexpected uh, if you consider this part of the calculation of the effective frequency and the matching condition. So this dashed line here, this horizontal line, would actually give us a field profile under these conditions. And this exact field profile simulation is shown here in this plot on the left. So we get four robust matching conditions and some stuff here in the center. This figure in, this, in, this, in, the, in the center is the experimental field profile, uh, again, under the same condition. So mutation 17.8, pulse length 48 nanosecond. So you see that the, sim the simple simulations give a pretty good indication of what you will find in your experimental profile. So after an optimization of the short repetition time, we found that this condition was the best one. And here we recorded a nice on signal. So you see this, uh, this signal here in this uh, figure. 
And we also measured the build-up time and the nuclear T1. So that was 25 and 24 seconds. So now we can calculate our enhancement factor, uh, an enhancement factor that can be compared to the enhancement that we actually did upon the Boltzmann polarization of, of the nuclear spins. And this factor was 64. So how does this compare to top DMP? So in our hands, um, this is what we got with, with top DMP. So our amplifier cannot quite get the 20 megahertz that was reported in the paper, but nevertheless, we wanted to try to reproduce the experiment from the paper. So it's 10 nanosecond pulse length, delay 14 nanoseconds, modulation frequency 41.6 megahertz. Uh, here you see uh, the field profile, the simulation of the field profile. And here you see our experimental uh, observation of the field profile. In our hands, this, uh, this condition all the way on the left at minus 95 megahertz was the best performer. And um, when we measured the buildup time, 43 seconds, we calculated for the on signal, we calculated the Boltzmann enhancement factor of 42. So in our hands so far, uh, the XIX sequence is indeed performing better, um, which we thought would, could be due to the fact that it's anti-symmetric. So but maybe now you're thinking your comparison isn't really fair because you just told me that your amplifier is not really capable of producing these short pulses. So maybe you can put them in into your amplifier, but who knows what comes out and who knows how that will affect the sequence. And if this is what you're thinking, then I, I agree with you. So what we did is we actually um, looked at a long pulse version of top DMP to make the comparison more fair. So now we are still um, mutation frequency, 17.8 megahertz, but now the pulse length is 48 nanoseconds and our delay is 34 nanoseconds. This gives a modulation of frequency of 12.2. So now we will need a multiple of the modulation frequency to get to the proton Larmor frequency. Um, well, yeah, that, that in principle should not be a problem. Here is the simulation, which spinach of the field profile. And from the simulation, I'll pick this condition to try uh, top DMP to get a nice on signal. So what we see now is that the buildup time is considerably improved. So indeed, there was probably a problem with the pulses. Um, nevertheless, when we now calculate the Boltzmann enhancement, it's, it's 49. So still, it seems that the XIX sequence is an improvement. So um, yeah, you can imagine that we were quite happy that, um, when we got this result. So we thought, can we do even better? Um, and uh, this is when TPPM uh, came up. So um, actually, we know from a novel and our experience with off resonance novel that the, the effective dipolar coupling that is able or that contributes to the polarization transfer is scaled. When you go off resonance, the scaling is decreased. So the effective dipolar coupling is weaker. So we were wondering if something similar could perhaps be happening with the top DMP sequence and its uh, related sequences. So um, if you look at XIX, now I have to go back in my slides a bit. Um, if you look at XIX, clearly on a resonance, your effective frequency. Um, so what we want to do, we want to look at on resonance because we think that the scaling factor might be higher there. But if you look at XIX, this can, pro this can never work on resonance because clearly here your effective frequency will be zero as you also see here in this calculation. But what if you can change if you change the phase between these two pulses? In that situation, you might be able to, to get something going on resonance. So that's why we wanted we started trying TPPM. Right, so TPPM. So this is really just the first attempt uh, at getting TPPM, TPPM DMP to work. Uh, this is a good day for our amplifier, 19.2 megahertz and a pulse length of 18 nanoseconds. That we, that's what we started with. Uh, modulation frequency, 27.8 megahertz. So here we uh, calculated the effective frequency. And here you see that at two times the modulation frequency minus the effective frequency. And here, this is a phase or phi of 155 degrees divided by two. We see that we have a matching condition on the resonant. So actually, um, uh, this was not so easy to find, so we ran quite a lot of simulations, 2D optimizations, as you see an example here with the phase angle on the x-axis and the nutation frequency on the y-axis. But here you also see that there is indeed a matching condition around 20 megahertz, which is what our amplifier can do. 
So, so far we've only looked at the, uh, the answer. We tried to optimize and looked at the on signal. Uh, the buildup time was 28 seconds and our Boltzmann enhancement was, thir was 34. So clearly TPPM, well, it works, <laughs> which is nice in itself, uh, but so far it's not yet better than what we have seen in top DMP or with XIX. So actually what we would like to do is try a version of TPPM with longer pulses, because it could be that again, our amplifier is, is, yeah, is, is interfering with uh, the efficiency or the effectiveness of this pulse sequence. Okay, so that brings me to my uh, summary uh, slide. Um, so I, I've shown you numerical simulations uh, with spinach and um, they suggested that electron proton polarization uh, transfer is more efficient uh, with XIX DMP than it is in top DMP. And actually um, in experiments at, at Q-band, uh, we've shown that with a mutation frequency of 17.8 megahertz, we indeed get a higher enhancement for XIX DMP than uh, we got for top DMP. So 64 versus 49. We also did numerical simulations with on resonance phase optimized TPPM. Um, the experimental verification is here is incomplete, but this is something that we're still working on. For now, the nice thing is that it is working. So as an outlook, um, I think we would like to try to, uh, or on our to-do list, we have that we want to continue searching for matching conditions because uh, in these systems, it's quite complex. So it, it takes you some time to develop an intuition of where you might find suitable matching conditions that are actually fast. And also we would like to try more experiments uh, and more, more simulations. And for example, I've been wondering whether it would make a difference whether you combine a polarizing agent with a certain sequence in terms of of performance. So for the future, I'm interested to see which other sequences there might be out there, um, but I'm also excited to hear about pulse, uh, pulse shaping and frequency sweeping, which I know that some of you uh, are doing. So with that, I, I come to my acknowledgement slide. Um, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, Rao, my postdoc, uh, did a large part of this work, uh, but I should also acknowledge the uh, PhD students in my group, and in particular Xiaoshun and Sanjay, who helped with the DMP experiments. I should thank Mikhailo for helping us keep the spectrometer in good shape, and I should thank uh, Bruno at the workshop of the university to help us with the construction of the tuning box. Um, so, and then I uh, would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, <clears throat> that was a really nice talk, Jennifer. Uh, you really sort of opened up the, a new area for everybody to start, start thinking about uh, and maybe trying to do a few experiments, all right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the experiments, as you've indicated, are going, to be, are going to be difficult. It's hard to make microwave pulses at very high frequencies these days. Uh, we'll get there, but, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, Dominic uh, has a question. Uh, the peaks in the experimental field profiles are quite a bit broader than in the simulations. Uh, what do you think are the factors leading to this broadening? Um, yeah, several factors. Um, but um, well, so when we do the simulations, we only include one uh, electron and one proton. Why don't you and go for, back to your, to your field profile so we can... Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So... Oh, it's a bit slow. Um, so, and we know that um, a trital is interacting with many tens of, of, of protons, which actually also are the cause of the, of the line width uh, at Q-band, apart from a small G in isotropy. We did not take into account that kind of interactions into our simulations, but they are probably the reason that in the field profile, I mean, the field profile, they are there. I mean, it's just following the EPR spectrum, so to say. Um, we should probably also take into account the real distribution in, in, in the resonance offset in the simulations, but we, we didn't do that. We were really just focused on, yeah, the DMP sequence itself, is the sequence working or not? And we just wanted to get an indica indication of where we would expect an enhancement. Um, but yeah, we could definitely improve the simulations. Um, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so Phila uh, Reinbold asked, uh, when you optimize the phases, what did you use as a figure of merit? Ah, okay. Uh, in the simulation, you mean? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. And I think I, I, I realized that maybe in my talk, I didn't really um, talk so much about this. 
Um, so, and actually we typically look at the contact curve and you see, for example, here also in this 2D simulation that we, so actually what's plotted here is IZ. And um, for example, here, you see that the, the matching condition that we worked at is sort of red. So here we get to an IZ of 0 0.25, 0 0.3. And, and this is the figure of merit that we have been sort of using. So what are we getting out of the simulations, even though our, our simulations are really a simplification? of uh, what's happening in reality. But actually what you can see already here in the simulation, so here we have 0 0.25, 0 0.3, but if you compare the simulation of, of top DMP, uh, so here it's 0 0.07, uh, for example, and um, here, uh, yeah, so here for XIX, it's 0 0.08. Um, so that, that's what we've been looking at. So how, can we get a fast transfer? Uh, and do we get a high, a relatively high uh, IC? That's what we've been uh, looking for. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Fred. Uh, may, 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 maybe before going to Fred's okay. question, because Brian's yeah. question is actually relevant. It's on this slide, so maybe just, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so Brian's question is for the XIX experiment, why did you choose the condition at minus 40? Megahertz offset. It looks like the enhancement is larger at minus sixty. I think yeah, that that that's that's what indeed for the fuel profile. That is correct. Um, but actually, um, the whole process of of optimizing is a bit of an iterative process, and um, you need to, also, for example, this uh, you need to optimize also um, the short repetition time. Uh, and this fuel profile was recorded with a short repetition time that was not optimal for this condition, but more optimal for this condition. So that's why in the fuel profile, this one seems to be worse. But overall, when you optimize the, the short repetition time, you take that into account as well. This one was the better one. Um, so yeah, it, it, this is, yeah, I, I, I agree. This looks a bit, um, it's a bit misleading if you just look at the fuel profile. Yeah. Yeah, and actually maybe something to, to, to think about here as well is that the, um, the optimal for the shot, so the short repetition time, so the delay in the, I um, just go like this, way to the beginning. Um, so there is, there's this delay in between the DMP sequences because you need the electrons to, to relax. But depending of course on the trajectory, that uh, of that you may generate with your pulse sequence that um, the magnetization might end up well maybe in the xy plane or anywhere in between so and the, the trajectory depends on your resonance offset so it might be that for some uh, offsets you may don't need such a long spin relaxation actually with top dmp you don't go very much to the xy plane at all you kind of stay here so that's why you can get uh, get away with a pretty high uh, short repetition time, but it's also not exactly the same for for each of these conditions. So that that makes it more complicated still. I I think that that Kong wanted to ask something. Oh no no, no I'm just I'm just saying that uh yeah oh but but it's a it's a very nice one. I mean indeed like I think like when we were you know at MIT working on this like we talk about different things using different conditions. But this is I think it's a very nice one, and then like, I think like I think you know. If you compare the NMR power sequence library with EPR, <laughs> EPR is like so yeah, relative, relative fewer. I, I think like we could indeed take a lot of sequences for NMR and then like we could try it out. I think I think this is quite promising. Yeah, but uh, that's just my comments. But I'm just curious. Uh, so um, so how do you make the phases? Do you have an AWG or use the power shape forming unit? Or I'm just yeah. No, um, so on the spectrometer that I showed you, we yep. don't, we can't do that. Um, so you, oh, but actually, um, um, so all you need is a so-called MPFU, a microwave pulse forming unit, yep. and then you can just calibrate the phases before you start. Um, okay. So okay. yeah, that's what we did. Okay, yeah, I, I, because we also, I mean, like, I think if I remember, you can maximize use two different pulses, right? Or two or four, two, Okay, I, I think I know what you mean. Yeah. And uh, just. Yeah, so you, you just find, you, you use the simulations to find a good phase. And then you also have to set that. So you don't want X minus X, but you want something else. So in this case, we wanted 155. So this means that you need to adjust the phase of one of your channels, basically. And, and just one quick question uh, What is the duty cycle of your 10 watt Q band amplifier? Um, 
I actually don't know by heart. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, oh. We have it hasn't like interfered with something we wanted to do. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I actually don't know by heart. I guess it's, I'm, no. it's a few percent. One, it's, it, it's not. Yeah. It, because like the one that I use at Booker Rough Weber, I think that has ten percent. Well, yeah, like, it's something similar. It's definitely more than the TWT at Xpen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Fred uh, Fred Mintic has a question. Uh, very nice talk, Jennifer. Uh, would you think that narrower radicals would help? Uh, can the T1E of the electron spins be an issue if it's too long? Um, yes, so if it's too long, that's typically not good. Yeah, uh, because then you cannot um, apply your next sequence so quickly. Uh, and, and I mean, you want to, this is this like, analogy with pumping the, mic, the, the polarization into the sample. Um, if your pump can go faster, you are, you're better in, in, in battling the nuclear relaxation, so to say. So you want to apply your sequence more often. Uh, and yeah, then so slowly relaxing, maybe VDPA at 80 Kelvin would not work or hardly. So yeah, actually that is why I think BDPA at, uh, well, yeah, it, it actually depends. It depends a bit uh, how, what the exact uh, relaxation is. Whether narrow line radicals would help. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't tried. We've only tried with, with tritals so far. Um, actually, I think it probably works, but it's hard to say because yeah, I, 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 I don't know, actually. I, I don't know. I don't have a- You're not going to get a much, well, tritle has a G anisotropy that you're going to see as you go up. Yeah, yeah. But really, the only possibility is to go to BDPA, which has a smaller genus atrophy. Uh, but uh, well, only recent we have a we have a um, so Snorri uh, in Iceland just made a nice um, uh, <clears throat> version of BDPA, which is water soluble. Uh, we haven't studied it carefully yet, so. It, it may be a possibility for a narrower line at higher fields. So. Yeah. yeah, so okay, it definitely at the higher fields, the narrow line radicals would be probably be superior. No. Yeah, I don't know, but at this field, what could be na more narrow than title? Yeah, it's still quite okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I cannot think of any. Yeah. yeah. So Aaron says, could you add some metal spins to help reduce the electron T1, gadolinium doping, for example, right? Um, um, I, I don't know. So actually, um, so when I, when I first did the novel experiments with Tritol in, 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 in frozen DMP juice, I typically had, um, a short repetition time of one milliseconds. And if after the, the spin lock you apply flip up, half a millisecond was was the best I could do. And then if you go faster, you'd really see the enhancement drop because the electrons don't have time to relax. But yeah, with novel, they really are in the XY plane. Whereas with these sequences, they're somewhere in between and we can go with several hundred microseconds shot repetition time or 150 or 100 microseconds. So it's I'm not sure if this is the limiting factor at the moment. I, we haven't studied that enough, tried this out enough. So yeah, I, I don't know if this is necessarily yeah what we should do at, at this point. Okay, and Raj has a question for higher field magnets uh, up to 14 Tesla. What do the simulations predict for TPPM DNP in comparison with top and off resonance novel? We have not tried it yet. We have not tried it yet. <laughs> well, so so novel, it's it looks like we've done some experiments at Cuban and the the line gets narrower. So the off resonance, at least in the case of tridal, is going to be harder to do, probably. You're going to have yeah, to- Yeah, yeah, that sounds fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but we, we haven't really tried anything uh, at Hartford. So Dominic has another question. Uh, could you vary the modulation frequency by varying the pulse widths in TPPM? Sweep fr swept frequency TPPM has been shown to be a little bit more efficient uh, compared to TPPM. So there are various versions of TPPM. Um, yes, probably. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we want to, so actually this was just a, because it, here in TPPM, it was a bit harder to find a good matching condition. Uh, so I always been doing the simulations and this was one that we found. Um, we definitely want to try it with a different pulse length, um, but we, we have to search for what is a good matching condition. So yeah, we're still developing this intuition and, and yeah, who knows, maybe a frequency swept form would indeed, yeah, be superior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So if you go to your last slide or one of your last slides where you had the uh, the next one, maybe next one, you had the TPPM plot there, okay. right? So go back there, go back, go back. This one. one. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> the only matching condition you hit was the low, the low, uh, the low frequency, the low yeah. right there. Yeah. So what happens at say, if you go up to what is it, 30? 30 megahertz or even up to if you what what do the simulations predict there for the enhanced? I mean it look it looks like you're gonna gain a lot. Yeah, it might it will probably get better. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we haven't tried to implement this experimentally. Um I mean I guess we could so now the resonator is pretty much fully overcoupled. I guess we could try even with our current amplifier to do some sort of go towards critical coupling. But actually, we, yeah, we kind of want to postpone this experiment until we get the new amplifier in, in June, hopefully. <laughs> and then we can try. Then then I can tell you more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it looks like it will be better. Although that maybe is not necessarily the most interesting thing, right? Because we want something that works well at the lowest possible amplitude, I, I guess. Um, but yeah, we still have to explore because there's still a, a lot to learn, a lot that we don't really well, understand. If you've got a large enough signal enhancement, it might be Yeah, OK, yeah. 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 OK, are there further questions? Uh, I don't see any more. Uh, so again, let's thank the both of the speakers for really a couple of really very stimulating talks, uh, very new different directions for magnetic resonance uh, with the triplet state DNP as well as with this uh, TPPM DNP. So, so you find thank you very very much, and Jennifer, thank you for for a beautiful talk as well. And Kong will be back in two weeks, right? Uh, yes, exactly. With and you want to tell us who the speakers are going to. Yes, um, so like two weeks later, uh, we will be having Michael Hope, who is a postdoc in Linden SA group. And then like for the second speaker, we'll be hosting Moreno Levy. Okay, from, from Florence, right. Okay, so we will see everyone in two weeks, all right? Thanks again for uh, coming and for all the really nice questions. And again, for two really uh, magnificent talks. Okay, yeah. Alex, all right, yeah. Okay, Kim, are you still there? All right. I owe you a big set. Whoever organized this little. Uh... <laughs> yeah, this Kong. Collected all the. Uh, well, who, I don't know who did this, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, right? It was Kendra. Huh? I sent some emails. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, here's some of the pictures that people have sent in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Oh my God, where are all these taken? Send them to you as a PDF. All right. Okay. <laughs> Nothing more celebratory than a PDF. <laughs> Too many yeah. incriminating photographs. <laughs> There's a. Uh, they're not as incriminating as maybe they should be. Uh, like a paella, like a bread smoke of paella. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And that's what, yeah, I'm trying to get Lyndon to purchase this house so everybody will have a place to visit. You know, it's only 3 million euros, you know? Oh. No problem. I don't know where that was taken. Yeah. Obviously, at some meeting, right? Mm -hmm. I know where that was taken. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it's maybe going a little slowly. Look at that. Hmm? Anybody. Waterville Valley, right? Hmm? Hmm? That was in Alex Pines' just living room. Oh, that's at my house when Shani, my daughter, is now a judge in Portland, age 50. How old was she? About five? Something Bob, like that. I came to Berkeley, we did some experiments together, and I could see him looking in this. I wrote this to Anne McDermott because she made, she wanted some slides for the ACS Wilson Award presentation. So this I actually didn't have those on the original slides. I I spoke, but it was and so it says, there we go, 1975, 76, thinking, hey, perhaps kids aren't that bad, and here we go. <laughs> hmm. I don't hold myself responsible, Bob, but congratulations. <laughs> Oh.
Oh, winter school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, from Dallas, right? Yeah, from Dallas. Mm. It's the first time some of them saw snow. Oh, so this was to test his memory. Bob, who are these people? Well, the old man can remember who's who. Jimmy Wang in the upper left, that's Sam Kaplan and Juan Q and Gibby and Itai, right? Yeah. Winning the I just was visiting here. He's uh, like 54, you big guy. Yeah. <laughs> what a memory. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was out at uh, UCSB for a seminar. Yeah. Where was that? Go back one. Oh, in Japan. Oh, that's oh. Yo, Yo Matsuki. Yeah, and it's Kostya. Yeah. 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 This is funny. No, oh, you should. You should stay on that slide and let them read the words, the text. Well, that's, <laughs> that's in Lille, France, at right. the Duramar meeting, right? And uh, no, 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 no. Well, the one in the left is, okay. The one in the upper right was at Janir's birthday party. That's in Brussels. In Brussels. That's mm -hmm. right. There's Anne. Yeah, that's right. And the one in the lower right was on the way to Chamonix one year. That's right. Uh-huh. And the right, that's right. same as the, the other. Yeah. The low left, the same as the upper left, which is the, the three of us trying to tell Tim uh, uh, Tim Cross know. at the Magnet Lab how to run the uh, the EANC or something. He oh, was, something. Yeah. Okay. You know, well, he needed some advice, so some, we got together and basically told him what to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. That's all I've managed to pull into a PowerPoint for you. But... Well, that's a pretty good collection. Okay. Yeah. And for the attendees, who, if you want to say something, like please raise your hand, then I can unmute you. Then if you want to congratulate Bob, like in person or not in person, but if you want to un, you talk about, un about me. <laughs> well, generally, of course, I congratulated Bob. I mean, when well, I mean, it's long overdue. It's been sure that happened. Yeah, yeah. Years. But it's I mean, a like a long, uh, long time, and it's been it's fantastic news. We're all absolutely overjoyed, Bob. Just. Well, thank you very much. But we, 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 we go back like 70 <clears throat> years. I mean, <clears throat> Bob goes back longer than I do. <laughs> Not by much, but a little. Not much, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Adiabatic oh, there's Bjorn. Do you have Bjorn Kong? Bjorn. Hi. How are you doing? Surviving, we're surviving, right? Yeah. Huh? So again, con congratulations from me also in person now. Okay. And I think speaking for all of us, for all of your former students and I think also current students and, and postdocs that we would not be here where we are without you, without your support, your ongoing support. So thanks for that and <coughs> you really well, deserve this. Well, thank you. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't be where I am without you, <laughs> period. You know? So now I think you've already been rich. Now you're also famous. So you, at least you've made it. Slightly more, right, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Bob, congratulations. Go, Bob. <laughs> go ahead, Anne, yeah. Come visit sometime. I'm not going anywhere. Something. As soon as I can get on a plane, all right? <laughs> Been a long time. And nice I have, to see I, you. Have, I have a lot of, okay. Okay, see you later. All right, yeah. Anyway. Who thought that DNP could possibly go that far? It means, Tico always said it means do not publish, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, that was his. Favorite expression, do not publish, right? Huh? <laughs> Anyways, terrific. It's wonderful to be celebrating. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Hello, Anya. Hi, Bob. Congratulations. Well, thank it's you. It's really uh, 
nice that they finally got it. <laughs> so I okay. wish you everything best with it, and uh, you. This is full of merit, and uh, I even I'm even sure you you get narrow lines now. So it's great. <laughs> Narrower, narrower lines, okay? Narrower. <laughs> no, they're very narrow. Better, right? As we <laughs> pass here and go to higher fields, it, uh, things are actually improving. <laughs> Getting to the regime, regime, uh, to the regime of respectability for high resolution, right? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Congrats again. All right, thank you very much. All right. So Anne, how are you doing? Good, good. Everybody seems busier, right? During COVID somehow we've all gotten. Yeah, no, it seems, yeah, it's just, things seem to take a lot longer, you know, uh, everything, so. Yeah, but good. And uh, little by little, New York's gonna come back to life. <laughs> yeah, well, Boston, Boston is slowly, yeah. Um, traffic this morning was pretty heavy actually coming in. Surprise. You're really ahead of us, huh? It's still, uh, we're, we're still inside uh, and have to be home at seven and so on. So still uh, heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, are you, are you, are you vaccinating people in, in Southern France? No, right? No. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's getting, it's going forward, but uh, I will have my second vaccination in the next month, but uh, it's still too slow compared to what is happening in the States, clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Germany also, right? There's uh, yeah. some kind of... Yeah. yeah, right. And we're all now, the, the, in, the infections are shifting towards the younger generations. So I can clearly see that the, the infectivity practically goes up and the, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not going so well right now. Mm -hmm. Well, they're just announcing here now that, that we're not going to reach herd immunity. Uh, so whatever that means exactly. I mean, people don't know exactly what that means, but they, <clears throat> it had gone up to about 80%, but they say we're probably not going to do that because there's a significant fraction of the population that <clears throat> will not get vaccinated. So there was a proposal this morning in the newspaper to start paying people a hundred dollars to get vaccinated. I should do this here. Uh, people are here also very uh, hesitant, uh, particularly older ones. It's really surprising. Well, I mean, it's, it, it is. I mean, the mRNA, you know, you're not getting anything of the, of the virus. You're getting some RNA, but, the, you know, that's the rest of the thing that makes it work. Uh, and people don't understand that, a lot of people. So, um, anyway. No. I was even I was even having a very hard time convincing my daughter to get vaccinated. <laughs> so anyway, she's she's going to, but uh, <clears throat> on her own on her own time scale. So yeah. Okay, so shall we adjourn for the day? Huh? Not until we see your champagne, Bob. Where's that champagne? <laughs> <laughs> I've already drunk it, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, congratulations. Uh -huh. no. Bye now. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And, and Kendra, where did you hide these photographs? And or who? Oh, I have a Dropbox oh. folder. I'll. I don't know that you have permission to see it, but I'll definitely pull them all out and send them to you. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Okay. Yeah, well, congratulations. It's long overdue. Oh, Eric Keeler raised his hand or something. I just saw it flash by. I don't know. Yeah. Eric Keeler. Hmm. Well, I was just going to say congratulations. Well, thank you, Eric. All right. I hope Anne is treating you well and you're treating Anne well. Huh? She is. I hope I am. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and enjoying New York City, right? I, I was, I was until we were, we've been stuck inside for a long time, but. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. We're all enjoying the inside of our apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah one, one nice thing was, uh, I don't know if you realize, Bob, that the photographer was actually taken at the Pont du Gard, which uh, showed you and Lisa and me some huh. years ago. And actually, 
during the, the this uh, pandemic, I went to the Pont du Gard and it was the only time I saw it empty. It was impressive. There was no one on an old 2000 year old aqueduct without tourists. So that was uh, one of the, the rare advantages of all this. Yeah, yeah. I can show you a, uh, let me show you a photograph of the inside of MIT, just a second. It's really a, a an interesting, um, the uh, <clears throat> infinite corridor um, right after our lockdown here. Let me just show you this. It's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Um, do you remember the infinite corridor at MIT? It's always full of people, hundreds of people running up and down it uh, yep. from one yep. class to another. This was at 11 13 one morning. <laughs> Oh, wow. Completely. I think this, this was usually crowded even at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, no, you would find people there any, I mean, all times of the day or night. Somebody would be there, okay. But it's it's been totally locked down. <clears throat> I mean, you can, there are people in there now uh, because people can go in and out of the, in and out of the, the building. But it's still very sparsely populated compared to you know, normal density. Yeah, will be only a transition state, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Uh, get your friends, get your friends and enemies all vaccinated, all right? So we, <laughs> so we can get back to normal, right? They will have some champagne in the south of France. Quite a lot, right. <laughs> Kendra would like some champagne in the south of France, right? Huh? I would really like some champagne in the South. I mean, champagne anywhere, but particularly in the South of France. <laughs> Kendra is a huge Francophile, right? Yeah, I've been grounded for like a year and a half. It's horrifying. <laughs> okay, so it's almost one o'clock. We should probably all adjourn and go do some real work, all right? Well, for me, all it's right. apéro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye now. All right. Thanks again. Congratulations, I really Tom. do. I mean, really do appreciate all the uh, time and effort and uh, great memories you brought out. Okay. Sure, right. Bye. 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 bye.